Thank you, John. Thank you, Tanya. I'd like to thank the, um, the organizing committee for the invitation today. I have nothing to disclose. As we all know, the total proctocolectomy with iliopouch and anastomosis has become the standard treatment for uh, ulcerative colitis patients. The, the matter of the pouch and the ideal method for pouch and anastomosis is still a matter of debate. In one hand, we have mucosectomy with hands-on anastomosis which entails the stripping of the distal rectal mucosa that is prone to disease, uh, dysplasia, and cancer, and performing a manual anastomosis. On the other hand, we have a double staple technique that preserves the anal transition zone, which is important for function. And this is done by transecting the rectum and top of the anal canal and using a circular stapler for anastomosis. As Jones just mentioned, uh, Parks and Nichols were the first to report the anastomosis of a ileal reservoir to the anal canal. And in the, when they first described it, they described it with mucosectomy. Just uh, two years later, with Sonomia from Japan, reported his experience stressing the relevance of a mucosectomy for, with preservation of fecal continence and prevention of pelvic infection. He also expressed his concern about uh, cancer being developed near the dentin line in the transitional epithelium of some patients with adenomatosis. Over the few years later, there were several reports uh, reporting the experience with mucosectomy, and there was a concern for a high rate of sepsis, up to 25% of these patients, and anastomotic stricture, as well as a small bowel obstruction before and after ileostomy reversal. Bowel function also was not that great. There was a high incidence of up to 55% of uh, leakage, especially soiling during the night, and major leaks also up to 25%. And about 50% of the patients, they had problems discriminating gas from solids and liquid stool. Those papers, however, they had a short follow-up. Wexner, in 1989, he described the combined experience with the group from Minnesota of 114 patients who had undergone pouch and anastomosis with mucosectomy with a mean follow-up time of five years from ileostomy closure. And they found that uh, this, one of every five patients had incontinence to gas. One of every 10 patients had some incontinence for liquid stool during the day. Two of every four patients had leakage at night. And up to 70% of these patients wore protective pads. And this is because 63% of them had reported improvement of pouch function over the years. In, they concluded that while the results of the pouch and anastomosis with mucosectomy were acceptable, they were far from perfect. The reasons uh, for poor function associated with mucosectomy were attributed to the removal of the anal transition zone and muscle and sensory impairment due to the prolonged anal retraction causing trauma to the sphincters. This was demonstrated by Keith Lee who uh, recommended abdominal mucosectomy in compare with the traditional transanal mucosectomy. He showed significant reduction in the maximum resianal pressures in the patients and their going endoanal trans, uh, mucosectomy compared with the abdominal approach where there was no change in pressures. Besides pouch function and complications associated with the mucosectomy, another concern with the technique was brought up by O'Connell in 1987, who examined 29 excised ileoanal pouch specimens evaluating different regions of the pouches. And they showed that 21% of these patients had residual islands of rectal mucosa. This concern even increased when the first reports of pouch uh, cancer started to uh, appear, and really questioning the adequacy of mucosectomy to protect these patients from dysplasia and cancer. The double stable technique was reported 
around 1989 by three different surgeons, Waxner, uh, Dr. Kifflin in the UK, and Johnston in Leeds in the UK. And Waxner, in 1990, he, w he reported he the prospective evaluation of functional and physiological outcomes in 15 patients who had undergone double staple technique. He found that 10 out of 11 patients were never incontinent, which was different from the mucosectomy patients. There were six patients that were wearing protective perianal pads, sometimes or rarely. And he made a note that these were the patients, the majority of them, they required uh, suture reinforcement and transanally. So basically, they had a mucosectomy. Regarding the resting pressures, there was a decrease in the maximum mean resting pressure at three months post-op. That was attributed to the staple introduction, but this decrease was nothing comparable to the mucosectomy group and also recovered at 12 months. They concluded that double staple uh, pouching and anastomosis was associated with excellent objective, physiologic, and subjective functional results. However, there was a very small group of patients. There was a number of comparative studies comparing hands-on versus double staple techniques after that. And uh, one of the largest ones was the group from Ohio who reported a comparative study in, three, in 300,000 patients. The majority had undergone a staple anastomosis. And they found that hands-on patients had significantly more septic complications, anastomotic structure, small bowel obstruction, and pouch failure. The function also was significantly worse in these patients with increased incontinence, seepage, pad usage, dietary, social work restrictions. However, there was same bowel frequency and urgency. The quality of life also was significantly worse in the hands-on patients. Uh, there, were, there are two meta-analyses on the topic. The most recent one, the largest one, is the one published by Love Group in 2006 and included 21 comparative studies with 4,183 uh, 4, patients, 64 of which uh, had undergone hands-on anastomosis. The meta-analysis show there is no really difference as far as complications between the two groups. Although the hands-on group, there was a tendency for pouch failure. There was a significantly worse seepage of a stool during the day and night in the hands-on group. Also in this group, they wore more protective pads and they had more incontinence to liquid stool. This was reflected also by worse manometric parameters found in the hands-on group compared to the staple. Regarding the ATZ pathology, inflammation, there was no difference between the groups. There was a trend for higher dysplasia seen in the staple group compared to the hands-on, but this was not statistically significant. There was one case of cancer in the end of transition zone that was seen in the staple group. The meta-analysis supported the selective use of staple pouch and anastomosis in view of its better functional outcomes and less disruption of the anal sphincter mechanism. Chronic inflammation can be a concern because suppose a precursor for dysplasia and cancer. And with this in view, Silvestri compared 66 patients who underwent a staple anastomosis who had chronic inflammation with 228 patients who had mucosectomy without chronic inflammation. They did not detect any dysplasia and there was no impact on long-term function. In fact, the function of the stapled group was better than the group with hands-on anastomosis. Lavery also reported that of 270 patients with chronic inflammation, only 14.7% had symptoms, and only 2.3% of them needed treatment. The main issue with the leaving the transition zone is really the risk with dysplasia and cancer. Renzi from uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, he followed up 178 patients who had undergone a staple anastomosis over 10 years or more. And the, this group did not include patients who had dysplasia or cancer within the 18 centimeters for anal verge preoperatively. 
the incidence of dysplasia was only 4.5%. There was no cancer. The risk increased with a history of uh, dysplasia or cancer, independent of the location. The authors recommend an algorithm of selective mucosectomy with a manual anastomosis in patients with dysplasia in the lower two-thirds of the rectum or with colon or rectal carcinoma. There is a systematic literature search on iliopouch adenomas and adenocarcinoma from 1979 to 2010, which showed that there, are, there is in the literature 28 cases of pouch-related dysplasia. The majority of them is seen in the hands-on group, and some were found actually in the pouch body, 15 the anal transition zone. And the majority was in the mucosectomy group. There are 43 cases of pouch-related cancers, the majority in the mucosectomy group again. The cancer was also found in the pouch body in 11 patients and 32 in the anal transition zone. Again, the majority in the mucosectal group. Why there is a lot of heterogeneity in this uh, group of patients and also whether surveillance of the pouch was done or not at the frequency, I think this slide shows us that the cancer and dysplasia can occur in the pouch, and mucosectomy does not really protect. To further support the double staple technique, Leanne showed that outcomes after anastomotic leak are significantly worse in the patients who, who had hands-on anastomosis. We saw it in the post-operative bleeding within the pelvis was significantly higher, and the pouch failure also was significantly higher in the patients with hands-on group. And patients also who had manual anastomosis had worse incontinence at five years. So weighting the advantages and disadvantages between hands-on and staple anastomosis, we can start saying that display, the mucosectomy group has the advantage of uh, decreasing the dysplasia or cancer risk, although we know this is not 100% true. On the other hand, the staple group has a better function then we say that mucosectomy can decrease the risk of colitis, although there is no real impact on function. We can say that the staple has less complications. The Hansen group, on the other hand, some people advocate there is no need for surveillance, although we saw that cancer also can occur in the pouch and they should be surveilled. And the staple group, is, uh, the mucosa is very rarely accessible for surveillance, so that's the one advantage if cancer or dysplasia occurs is in the pouch and not outside the pouch. On the other hand, the staple group is easier, is simpler to perform, faster, and the outcomes are better in case leak occurs. In conclusion, staple anastomosis should be the preferred technique for partial anastomosis. Mucosectomy might be relevant for patients with dysplasia in the lower two-thirds of the rectum or cancer in the colon or rectum. Having said that, I know this is not uh, uniformly accepted, but the truth is that we need, we need more data because the incidence of dysplasia is very low, and we also we need longer follow-up to assess more accurately the risks of a dysplasia in cancer in those patients who had the anal transition zone preserved, and I would say those who had mucosectomy as well. Thank you.